You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. lives mattered because they were baptized into Christ and they died and rose with him. And their callings were their callings despite whether there was a ring on their finger. Welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for youth and their adults too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter in Singleness. I'm your co-host Erica Sorensen along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Pastor Goodman, it's good to see you. Would you introduce our guest today? Yeah, um, so uh, our, our guest today has actually been somebody that I have been mistaken for on more than one occasion. Um, you do. And they asked me to play the organ. Um, it, it might Not be good. the nose. I don't know. Um, but uh, this is uh, this is my good friend Paul Sola. He is cantor and director of music at St. John Lutheran Church. He's an adjunct professor of music at Concordia Seward, and he is cantor for Higher Things, and I believe uh, through Doxology as well. Is that right? A little bit everywhere. You everywhere you can make some music. I and your it. brother from another mother. There we go. It's, I'm Czech, but I guess I have a Jewish nose. <laughs> Maybe I have a know. Czech nose. You don't know. Maybe uh, it's a Czech nose. I don't know. It's Who knows? It could be fun to speculate because I'm sure we won't get in any trouble going down that road, guys. It'll let's be talk no, about something great. less uncomfortable like being single um because in the christian setting um it, it's it's the one sort of place that defies the the norms as far as getting married later and later in life and christians tend to uh get married very very young for reasons i think most people can do the math on uh and that means that that um because it, it becomes such a normal situation uh in a lot of cases the, the church is almost sort of ignored single people right and not always to it to a good degree i'm kind of not known what to do with them has that been your experience paul You're, we're just asking you to like throw church right under the under the bus from from the get-go i will say yes i will say too <laughs> that i will say too that i was single for 10 years as an adult and um so i have a little bit to speak into this although it's not my interview but um it does become kind of the thing that like everybody's like why are you you're not married you're you're old enough to be married. Why aren't you married? Do you know you can be married? Kind of a thing. And it's um kind of those those helpful folks that are not always entirely helpful. And I interrupted you. I'm sorry, Paul. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I would say in in anything as I get older and maybe wiser or maybe just more tired. I think that's <laughs> probably part of it. You meet people from different perspectives and different backgrounds, and then you see that, oh, there's a lot of nuance with this. It doesn't travel well on sound bites or memes or without a personal relationship. So when people put edicts out there on maybe social uh, with a lot of wagging hands and fists and things, uh, anger for one, one way or the other, it probably isn't helpful and we can't receive that well. And so until we get to know a person, their background and their story, it's probably not great to make proclamations over their life and what appears to be their situation. Well, it's good advice for any person is develop a relationship with them, any any member of the body of Christ. To, hey, how about you get to know know somebody a little bit before? I mean, we have a we have a, a kiddo that's in uh, middle school and we're having, you know, middle school is tough for all bullying and so forth. And, um, <clears throat> and they're already talking about like, who's your, you know, who you taking to the dance? They have a dance already and, and all those things. And I feel like some of those pressures start sort of relatively young in terms of, um, and way too young sometimes, I think, for, for kids and youth to, to even be thinking about that before they've even fully developed executive function. Um, 
but I, I, um, but I know in in the Bible, Saint Paul talks about actually celibate, like be, not being married allows you some really special things. Um, you don't have to be married to have a full life. You don't have to be married to somebody else. Um, it, if that's not necessarily your calling, it can actually be considered quite a gift. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, Paul? Do you agree with that? Has that been your experience? It definitely. And I would say definitely over time, you see and appreciate that more and sometimes more than others. I guess if there, if there's one thing that I've learned over uh, 17 years as kind of an adult, I guess, 17 years as somebody who has a salary and benefits coming to them. So we'll define adult like that. that way. I like yeah. that. So we're showing good. up to a job and those things. But that from day to day, I'm going to feel differently about that in the relationships and the people that I have in my life. And some days that's going to be seen as I am really thankful for the things that I get to do and the people that I get to interact with in this particular calling and in, in singleness and for the relationships I get to have with my married friends and their kids and to be in their lives and to be part of my church and the people who are uh, widowed and widowers and just to be among all of that in a way that I probably couldn't do in other ways. But I think before it was, it was set, and maybe in some circles it's set, your actual vocation calling in life isn't really happening until you get married or until you, you pair off or you find a person. So you're, you're waiting for something else to happen before you can actually feel like you're living life. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, the big, the big part in that changed, and I think tragedy teaches us sometimes the best lessons, not that we seek them out, but we, we don't really have to seek them out because life is full of that in a fallen world. And having three close friends and colleagues who lost children, both mm. if they were one being in 10 years old, another one at 15 and one at 22. So at varying stages in their lives and if you only point to being married and this whole checkbox system, none of them were there. So mm -hmm. it leads you to some really unfair conclusions then of saying either their lives mattered because they were baptized into Christ and they died and rose with him. And their callings were their callings, despite whether there was a ring on their finger or there were grandkids for their parents and all of those other things that we seem to make primary or that we really want to feel good about. So it's seeing that and that I could get hit by a bus tomorrow or this afternoon. But what I'm given to do right now in Jesus is what I'm given to do regardless of, of all of the other things and attachments. So not to live for today and forget about anything else, but mm -hmm. uh, be thankful and, and make hay while the sun shines. Mm. I actually really like that um, because it, it doesn't sort of only speak about what you are in the negative, but but more, it doesn't try and define you by a future that you can't predict. Uh, what I mean by that, so for me, um, I, as a pastor, uh, the question that I always ask me is like, how did you know you were supposed to be a pastor? And mm -hmm. like, I'm going, I, I have a fake pious answer that I can give people in public, but the, the truth, I don't, I, I they sent me out and I still wasn't entirely sure it was going to work so well. Um, I knew I was <laughs> supposed to be a pastor when I was ordained. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know today that uh, I, I'm supposed to be a father because I have kids and, and you can know today I'm supposed to be single because you're single. And so you're not sort of looking at, at you as incomplete and sort of saying, if it were right, it would be this, but you're saying, this is what I am today. And so this is what God has for me today. And so this is where I'm supposed to live. There, there's something that's got to be really, really freeing and not having to try to predict the future to find fulfillment, you know? Yeah, exactly. And the idea of uh, being given gifts in the here and now, I guess in, in any case, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. And if, if we're always looking to the side or to the back, it's really hard to look at the things that are actually in front of us and that are actually here. And we're going to always fall off the wagon in different ways. Everybody has weird hangups. And if you're somebody who overanalyzes things, you're, you're going to look too closely sometimes and get caught up in it. That's what we're given to do in community also so we can process and, and live and, and in the Christian church be reminded of who we are in Jesus. 
And, and that's part of what we're still given to do as single people uh, or people who are unmarried or however we want to define this. Uh, we're, we're given to live life among other people in, in different ways. Yeah, I always, I always sort of thought it was um, interesting. Um, I, I had a pastor talk to me at one point um, when I was, you know, an adult and single and it was, it was difficult. Um, I think, I think when you think about the Christian marriage, you know, there's the one flesh union, um, but that is not the primary union either. It is our, it's actually each individual's union with Christ in their baptism. And so, um, this particular pastor really helped me to see that, um, looking, looking forward to the future, right? We're not married in heaven. Um, we have a perfect, our, our union with Christ, um, our union with our God will be complete at that time and we won't have the need or the desire to be married. And so I think in a lot of ways, um, folks who have the, it's called a gift of celibacy because they are reflecting that future reality now because they are able to have that, that they have that union with Christ. And that is enough. St. Paul talks about, um, you know, um, uh, being, being dependent and, and understanding that God's grace is sufficient for him. And I always, that was kind of the thing that would, I would sort of drive back to that would give me quite, quite a deal of comfortable comfort. And it does now as a married person as well, is that, um, God is teaching me to be dependent on him. And that's a, that's a good thing and depend on my baptism, depend on my union with him rather than thinking that I have to find some magical person who's going to make my life complete, which is sort of the wrong way to go about it as well. I guess there's not really a question in that, is there? <laughs> no, but I affirm and agree with what you said. Well, thank you, Paul. Well, great. Well, we'll see you later. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> asking Got that question, covered. Then. Yeah, that's um, it, it's one of those things where um, if if you if it's not sort of like yours to to live, you're you're sort of guessing at the trappings and trying to define it more by by what it's not than what it is because you you don't really know. So it, it, in the same way, like my kids will will kind of sometimes stare a little bit when they they see somebody who is is in a wheelchair just because they're trying to figure out how they get around. Um, in the same way, we sometimes sort of paint a picture of immediately what people aren't, but you, you made a wonderful definition. I am baptized. Like this is where my identity comes from and this is where it has to start, uh, for a church that's supposed to start with baptism. Uh, and I know usually doesn't, what are some ways that the church maybe has not been helpful to, to living a, a single life? I think in a, especially in, in we're, we're talking specifically in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod uh, mm -hmm. style, a lot of times our emphasis and a lot of our, our time and energy goes into Lutheran education, which by default goes to children. Uh, there's a good thing. Yeah. We have a K to eight school. The preschool is very big. It's 80% of our budget in our congregation. And, and sometimes we wear out a lot of our energy with that, which builds an automatic kind of social thing where people you get to know, and not just saying from the outside, but those are relationships that then lend themselves towards supporting each other when, when other things happen. But if you're outside yes. of that, sometimes you don't have that connection. And I know at least for our church, we've, we've said sometimes that's difficult to get to either know people that have kids with families because they do have their own rhythm and, and it's busy as, as you both know as parents there's a lot mm -hmm. going on and as a teacher I get a little bit more of that but but sometimes we see our, our church and our school structure revolving just around that rather than maybe seeing the whole body and and the gifts mm -hmm. that are there to be offered but at different times in my life I really really appreciate that and I wouldn't really want uh, our situation to be different so it, I think for me, it's, it's a two-way street. I have an opportunity to meet and talk with people and to be approachable uh, with them, to form relationships, live in community. And, and, and that works out a lot, of, a lot of times very well. So I, I, I am very good at focusing on the negative. Anyone who knows me and knows I can usually <laughs> find that. It maybe make it a little funny too. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I look at that, I also see throughout the years and looking back positively, all the ways where, where those interactions with people who are both married and unmarried are great gifts in my life. And I love the community that I have, but that does, it's not just going to 
walk in my door and it's not just going to mm-hmm. live in my house. That That's part of, of my uh, goal, vocation and, and life. Wow. That's very wise. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what you've just talked about is that you're part of the, the body of Christ. I imagine you as the fingers because you're an amazing organist, but I'm not, I, I don't know for sure. But, uh, but that, that is important feeling that I think that was one of the great comforts to me as well. And always has been is that, um, even though sometimes in my emotions, I don't, I don't feel like I belong or, um, you know, when I've come to a new church, I recently moved to California, you sometimes you don't feel like you don't feel like part of the whole, um, but intellectually, you you do know that you are part of the whole, and you keep coming, you keep receiving, um, you keep going to those fellowship events, and 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 doing all of the things, and and um, and eventually you 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 are part of that body of Christ, and it is a I think it is a real gift as well. You're you're giving a very rich life among the congregation. Um, what else do I have? So where do you? Um, thinking about the kids and young people that are, are listening up to us today. Um, what would you tell, what, what would you tell kids who um, are thinking, Oh, just about their future, planning their future, deciding where to go to school. We've got lots of young adults, some of them who are saying, yeah, I don't know if I, I want to get married or um, I don't know. I, I don't know what kind of future plans I, I God has for me. Um, both one, you're a you're a college professor, so you deal and work with a lot of a lot of kids coming in, a lot of youth who are figuring out their what to do in their vocation um, to earn money, as you say, to be an adult. Um, but also, just what is family life going to look like? What is all of that going to look like? What kinds of um, advice would you give to the to the kids who are listening? Well, painting with broad strokes is usually dangerous, so I'm going to do it with yeah. reckless abandon now. Ooh, fun! <laughs> but the, I think the the best idea is is to follow some advice from Sister Act Two, where Whoopi Goldberg has a little song that she sings, and it's if you want to be somebody and you want to go somewhere, you better wake up and pay attention. But she raps it too; it's really cool. Uh, but <laughs> in all be. seriousness. Uh, I do teach an uh, 8 a.m. class college sometimes, and that's one of my favorite things to sing. They don't like it, but <laughs> that that we're aware of the things in our in our own life, of what's going on there. We're 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 participating in the life that we're given. I think the biggest problem that I have with that is my smartphone. Everybody's talking about that, but yeah. if I can't get up and look around at what's happening, I can't really be vulnerable to the people around me. So if, whether you're looking to be in a relationship or not, I think being present with the people around you is the biggest gift that you can give. And that helps you to kind of get to know the actual place you've been called rather than maybe the one that you wish you were at or the people that you were with before. We all have uh, things that we get positively from them. But for me, it helps me to have an escape. And that's not always great because it doesn't make me deal with the hard things around me. And so for mm-hmm. college students, so I see that a lot, uh, really being present, uh, seeing what's going on in your life. And usually then reminding yourself that there are times throughout life, at least it hasn't gone away for me in, in almost four decades, of uncertainty and of, yeah. of trouble and affliction. The Psalms are full of all of those things. We can use those when we don't have the words, or even when we do have the words, uh, to cry out to God in those circumstances that he reminds us that he's still present with us in that and that our clenching down on a certain idea of what our life should look like rarely produces the fruits we think it's going to. And so, I don't know, letting go of a little bit of that control, uh, whatever it is, it it probably isn't going to help to to really clench down on, I will find a spouse in three weeks and we will have a (laughs) ring by spring. If you say it in a robotic voice, it sounds ridiculous, but it's what it is. So, uh, Paul, as we kind of talk about an, an incarnational faith, a God who actually takes on human flesh and a, a, a God who was, was single, um, what can we find sort of a, a, as far as a, a fulfillment, a, as far as just a day-to-day life for the people who, who sort of go through life single some of them are very content and some of them like you said look forward and everybody even in day-to-day is going to have different things what does it mean that that not only was our god 
sort of well human but our god was was single for for us to to sort of find completion uh, an idea of peace i think looking looking to the long game and what jesus has laid out before us too when we confess that that he's coming again to raise me and all the dead and and that at that last day, we look forward to that being dealt with as as individuals and as as Jesus. At seeing the things that Jesus was given to do, both in his earthly ministry and now how he intercedes for us and doing that personally, but still doing that in the context of a community of people where we're given to to love and to serve those who are around us in the here and now. And that is so easy to say and so difficult to do, especially Mm -hmm. when you just want somebody else to give you a hug. And I think that that idea that there are, there are those people out there that when was the last time they got a hug? There, there, there are those things too, that are part of life still. We need that. But but that's ultimately what it's it's not it sounds cheesy to say that jesus has given us a hug yeah but he's also putting the people in your life right now to to be those hands and feet right now and to speak that love to you and that you're given to speak his love too and that doesn't revolve around the marital status Right. But I mean, that's sort of the safe place to wall it off. Um, and, and not always in a healthy way. I think in a lot of places, a really unhealthy way. You, you mentioned a couple of things. First, just the idea that like, it's it's almost hard to find a hug from a friend when that should be a pretty easy thing to find. You, you mentioned even just sort of how easy it is to get distracted by this thing. Uh, we, we live in a very Gnostic frontier, a, 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 a world where we've in a lot of ways waged war against the body. And, and and you're right. If you have sort of that one vocation inside of marriage, you have somebody who's who's sort of there to give you a hug. But I, I, I want to push up against that and sort of say it's it's actually pretty normal for friends to give hugs to each other. It's pretty normal to, to go and visit a widow and give her a hug and uh, it, it's actually a, a great place to actually, you know, really sort of poke the devil in the eye uh, because he wants you to think that the only place your body can matter is if it's doing one particular act for one particular thing. And mm-hmm. covetousness will always take over and, and, and lust in a lot of ways can too. But, but in, in reality, if we have a, a body that has been given and will be raised to, to not be married, but simply to be a part of the body of Christ, to be part of the heavenly host, to, to sing, to run, to dance, to do all the things that that the Psalms and, and the Old Testament points out. Um, I, I think it's actually a really great place for us to sort of, well, wage war against the idea that that our bodies don't matter unless they're being used for reproduction. Um, mm-hmm. to, to be able to give a hug to somebody and to, to be able to get one, it, it's not a bad feeling. It's it's a it's the right it's the right way to live your life. I think I read somewhere in uh, in uh, researching for a trauma breakaway that um, for emotional health, the average person needs about eight hugs a day. Or eight, you know, eight touches, eight, some sort of just, you know, think about your kids. Think about when they're little, you know, think about how much you just, you know, need hugs. hugs. And that doesn't change. It doesn't change. It doesn't change when you're in the home. It doesn't change. If you uh, have dementia, you still need, God has made our bodies and our souls this way and um, in a certain way. And we are, are, we are to be here and to be present. I love Paul, when you talked about giving advice to to folks to just be present, that is one way, one of the many ways you can just be present for another person is to just physically be present for them, physically be an ear, physically be hands to, um, you know, to high five or hug or touch in some way. Um, I think that's a really, really beautiful way to kind of wrap up our talk here today. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Hey, thanks for having me. We love having you around. We love talking to you. All right. Well, this has um, this has been another episode of Why Bodies Matter. Thank you for joining us today to discuss our faith in the flesh for this disembodied age. We'll catch you next time.